Ladies and gentlemen, you're very welcome to this uh, briefing. Um, before we start, just a couple of, uh, of, of house rules uh, before I hand over to my colleague Ruth. Um, if you have any questions for either of our speakers on today's subject, because I know there are a few journalists joining us, um, please use the chat facility and uh, I'll, I'll open that up in a second. And if you can identify yourself and your media outlet, because some people or any other outlet at all, or uh, just purely speaking, uh, are asking a question as an individual, uh, you can do that in the, in the chat facility and then we can call you uh, during the uh, Q&A. Um, and before uh, we start, can I just on a, on a personal note ex express uh, my delight in being able to, uh, to welcome uh, Marcus Chef here. Marcus is a, a, a particular individual that is an advocate for, for Israel. I've, I've long admired um, and um, purely and simply because he gets to the heart of the matter very, very quickly and he understands the importance of education um, and, and, and how education is a real tool in combating hate, uh, in working towards peace uh, and, and in changing outcomes for children in terms of for the future. Um, and um, he's had tremendous success uh, across the world. In fact, uh, just recently, the State Department in the US uh, published a report quoting uh, Marcus Sheff's organization, Impact SE, extensively for their, for their solid work um, and their reviewing of curriculums. And in fact, if one looks at the recent process of normalization um, with countries towards Israel, uh, education played a key part in that, curriculums played a, a key part in that. Uh, and in fact, even Saudi Arabia, which has traditionally been hostile towards Israel, uh, has um, amended and changed its curriculums for the, for the better. And of course, Marcus and his organization uh, keeps across that. There is of course one dark blot in all of that, and that remains the Palestinian Authority, and particularly how the Palestinians are educating their, their children. So when we talk about a peace process of Israel, one which is badly needed after, after what we saw uh, the last few weeks, one immediately starts thinking about education and, and are people ready on the ground? And if people on the ground are being taught from literally from the cradle to the grave to hate, that makes, uh, uh, makes the job extremely difficult and we all have a role to play in that. So with that said, I'd like to welcome everyone, remind you again about the, the chat facility, and I will hand over to my dear colleague and our head of the institutional relations, Ruth, to take it from here. And of course, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll catch up with, with you all very, very shortly. Thank you, and you're very welcome. Thank you, Alex. So again, welcome from me also. Um, I am uh, the head of uh, EU relations for the European Jewish Association and my colleague um, Alex, um, as you can see, APA stands for Europe Israel Public uh, Affairs for those who are uh, were not aware. Uh, Alex already welcomed my first speaker, which is uh, Mr. Marco Sef. So I'm going to also welcome and just to say what a delight it is to have uh, MEP Lucas, Man Lucas Mantel uh, from Austria. Uh, we'll hear from him uh, second. So, but because of that, I would like to maybe give you a very brief minute if you want to also introduce yourself and uh, uh, Lucas and just um, welcome my guest. Thanks for the invite, Ruth, and uh, thanks everybody for your interest. I look forward to Markus Chef's contribution to today's talk. He's really a uh, highly renowned expert. Uh, I'm serving in the European Parliament on behalf of my constituency. This is the Republic of Austria, and I have the privilege to head the multipartisan and interparliamentary group of the transatlantic friends of Israel in the European Parliament. And uh, that's why I'm more than happy about uh, our ongoing cooperation with the European Jewish Association and with, uh, let's say, all like-minded all around uh, the world, because it's needed on behalf not only of the people of Israel, but of uh, the values we represent and on behalf of the security we try to achieve for this generation and the generations ahead. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we look forward to hearing from MEP Mantle a little bit later. First, we're going to have uh, Mr. Sef. A delight again to have you. Uh, we follow, obviously, your organization's uh, wonderful work. Um, and uh, our guests are ready to hear from you. 
you. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, Ruth, uh, Alex, uh, and Deepa. And, and I'm honored to share this virtual platform with uh, Mr. Lucas Mandel, who has done so much to try and ensure that EU funds are not used to teach 1.3 million Palestinian children to hate, but are used for peace education. So I'll start by saying, we, we all know textbooks are uniquely authoritative. They, they convey the political and social values that society wants to impart to the next generation. But this is particularly so in the Middle East, where out, outside of Israel, you tend to get one book, one subject, one grade. And so, you know, while textbooks can be a powerful barrier against acting out violence, unfortunately, they can also be a blueprint for radicalization, as we do see so much in the region. So since 1998, Impact SE has been examining Middle East textbooks through UNESCO-derived standards of peace and tolerance. Those are respect for the other, respect for the individual other, gender equality, no hate, peacemaking as the way to resolve conflict, economic prosperity, historical accuracy, and the uh, really non-UNESCO standard of LGBTQ respect. And, and I have to say that there is good news. Um, our research shows there are improvements going on now across MENA textbooks. Um, you know, the most obvious example is the UAE, which teaches a moral education course, as they call it, which is actually quite remarkable. It teaches what, what is called wasatia, uh, moderation, the middle way, um, tolerance, respect, and peacemaking. And uh, Sheikh Mohammed Ben Ziyad reformed the national curriculum. Uh, it was written by the Muslim Brotherhood, did, and, and in 2006, he, um, you know, essentially did that uh, root and branch reform we are reviewing it now, so no spoilers at this point. Um, but um, let, let me say that so far, I think we can find it is, uh, it holds a leadership position in relation to curricula in the region. Um, but it is not just in the UAE, in Jordan. King Abdullah II reformed that Jordanian curriculum in uh, 2014. Um, it was, if you like, a corollary of his thinking following the Amman letter of 2004 and the conference of 2005. And he produced a much more inclusive, tolerant set of textbooks, particularly in respect to how Islam and other religions are portrayed. Tunisia, we, we found, is, has been, if you like, a long running model. Uh, for many years, textbooks there have educated about the importance of negotiations, peace, respect for the other, and, you know, teaching their own colonial past, but without hate. Um, as Alex alluded to, our report into the Saudi Arabian curriculum in 2019 highlighted dozens of offending examples of hate, uh, which needed to be removed. And our report was delivered to the highest levels of the Saudi kingdom, and they decided to act. And so reviewing the September 2020 books, as we did, we saw really significant improvements. Um, for instance, an infamous uh, hadith that stated that Muslims will uh, kill all Jews was taken out. Um, classic anti-Semitic trope that Jews control the world was also taken, taken out. Um, you know, this shows that change is possible and it wasn't just about anti-Semitism. We had shown uh, there was a whole chapter um, which was terribly homophobic. Um, they entirely took that out. Uh, really large pieces of material in relation to violent jihad was removed. So these things can be done and they can be done quickly. Israeli textbooks, uh, obviously we look at uh, constantly, while not perfect, promote peacemaking as the way to resolve conflict. They depict Palestinian history, narrative, national struggle, including, by the way, using that term Nakba, um, and um, the individual Palestinian other, which is, which is so important. I will say that ultra-Orthodox textbooks, they don't incite, but they need improving. They are not up to standard, and it's an issue we do take up with the Israeli Ministry of Education. Um, you know, clearly, it is not all rosy. The, the Turkish curriculum was significantly radicalized by Erdogan in recent years. Jihad war was introduced as a central value, along with uh, ethno-nationalist religious vision, which combines neo-Ottomanism and pan-Turkism. The, the Iranian textbooks are, are terrible. Demonize Jews, glorify terror, talk about 
hegemony in the region. And the, and the Syrian textbooks are, are radically Ba'athist, um, even in this day and age, as I'm sure you would imagine. And uh, in Qatar, despite the US influence on textbooks, anti-Semitism is unfortunately still central. Um, and so in relation to the Palestinian textbooks and, and looking, if you like, at that, um, that context in which they lie, they, they were totally reformed by the Palestinian Authority in 2016. Um, and with Turkey, it has to be said, they are the example in the region of textbooks actually getting worse rather than better. So a reform took place and they got worse. And in this curriculum, peace is not presented to Palestinian children as preferred or even possible. Peace agreements and proposals with Israel, which previously did appear in PA school books, were totally removed. Uh, there's one cursory mention of the Oslo Accords with Arafat's letter to Rabin, uh, doctored, changed, to take out his uh, remarks on cooperation with Israel. Um, and, you know, essentially pupils are taught that negotiations are not the way to achieve statehood. So the question is, you know, what is in their place? And the answer is, Jews are presented as liars, fraudsters, the enemies of Islam. They control finance, media, and politics. This is what it says in the textbooks. Children in, in, in the first grade, year one, are taught a reading exercise using the letter Ha, the Arabic letter. Um, and the, the choices they are given are Shahid, martyr, Hujum, um, attack, and Harab, run away. Um, so, you know, we're talking about six-year-olds here, and this is how they're taught the Arabic language. Nine-year-olds learn maths, not by adding apples and oranges like, like we might have done, but by adding the martyrs of the intifadas. How many martyrs died in the first? How many martyrs in the second? How many have you got? And by the way, when we're talking about martyrs, we're talking about, you know, people who, who blew up pizzerias and shopping centers and buses. Um, Newton's second law of motion is taught by encouraging 12-year-olds to endanger themselves, essentially, and involved in violent conflict. And, you know, Palestinian children are taught that death is a right, that dying is better than living. These are Salafi ideas which have no place in today's peaceful societies. Um, you know, they were taught a poem about sacrificing blood, nine-year-olds, to eliminate the usurper and to annihilate the foreigners. And 14-year-old and, and boys taught that if they attack and get killed, they will be rewarded with 72 brides in paradise. While girls are taught to be equal with the boys, they also need to engage in violence and become martyrs too. And, and Dalal Mugrabi, terrorist who, who killed 38 people, including 13 children, is a role model in these textbooks to young girls. And, and you know, I just give one final example. The 1972 Munich Olympic massacre is justified in these textbooks. Um, terrorists are, are, are glorified and um, you know, there is absolutely no contextualization whatsoever for, for, for this terror, only glorification. So none of this, of course, has gone unnoticed. Um, this European Parliament has twice passed cross-party legislation um, discharges, overwhelmingly condemning hate in the Palestinian curriculum. Uh, the United Nations' own committee to eradicate racism and discrimination uh, in August of 2019 condemned the anti-Semitism in the PA textbooks following a session we were involved in. And of course, the Norwegian government has cut funding to the PA Ministry of Education because of incitement in the textbooks. Um, I want to say just a few words about UNRWA. Um, UNRWA wrote their own material in 2020. And, and shockingly, much of that was as bad as the material of the Palestinian Authority. And really important, UNRWA teaches the Palestinian Authority's textbooks in its own schools in Gaza and the West Bank. During COVID, they created their own materials. One would have thought a UN organization would do better. It was just as bad as the material that they teach in the schoolrooms. Um, you know, it, content that violates UN values, UNESCO standards, and UNRWA's own stated principles, uh, promoting hate teaching, incitement to violence, glorification of jihad, martyrdom, and terrorism. And, and in Israel, a UN member state is the raised of all maps of a UN organization, UNRWA, and called the enemy. Um, it is a, a really dangerous uh, set of materials. 
students are called to defend the motherland with, with blood. Um, again, Dalal Mugrabi is, is glorified and, you know, dangerous libels and conspiracies are propagated, such as the Zionists intentionally set fire to the Al-Aqsa Mosque, um, that Israel deliberately dumps radioactive and toxic waste in the West Bank. Um, you know, and by the way, UNRWA teaching cards even denounced the peace between Israel and Arab nations. Um, this is an organization which is supposed to be neutral. Um, and so, you know, while UNRWA acknowledged that, as they say, inappropriate uh, material was produced, mistakenly produced, this material has never been taken back. Um, there's never been an explanation for why this happened. There's never been an explanation for what they are going to do to make sure this doesn't happen again. Um, and again, it's still in circulation. So the European Parliament condemned UNRWA's hate teaching in May of this year, and, and absolutely rightly so. And, and, and if I've got a moment, just finally a couple of words um, on the EU review of the PA curriculum, which is um, being done by the uh, George Eckhart Institute. Um, you might have seen that in the last week or two, the German newspapers Bild and Welt obtained copies of the report and um, their stories revealed that the EU's own report on the PA curriculum um, teaches, you know, shows that there is teaching of anti-Semitism, uh, that children are encouraged to violence and to jihad, that Israel is delegitimized. As both Welt, Bildt and Welt said, you know, this curriculum is entirely unfit for purpose. Um, and we have independently assessed the report we also got a copy and we you know, see that it concurs with many of our own findings over the last five years um, while missing some material, quite a lot, and misrepresenting others. But I'll just give you headlines. Um, these Palestinian textbooks in the report, the EU report, persist in the promotion of Jew hatred. Jews are referred to as enemies of Islam, for instance. The report confirms that those peace agreements um, were taken out. Um, the report confirms that um, the curriculum purposefully delegitimizes and demonizes Israel and that the textbooks promote violence, uh, particularly against Israel. So um, for this reason, lawmakers in the uh, European Parliament and in the Bundestag have criticized the EU Commission for its secrecy because this report has not yet been released by the EU. And, you know, it's been on everyone's desk, frankly, for months now. Um, they have failed to publish this long-awaited report on Palestinian textbooks, um, which was already delayed for two years. Um, and these newspapers called into question the continued funding of the Palestinian uh, education system, given um, this current state of affairs. Um, I must say, the report as I, does miss a great deal of material. There are serious shortcomings um, in terms of how it presents um, and what, what is missed. Most of the books are not reviewed. So most of the hate is missed. Um, the, uh, some books they did review, but missed things they should have seen. And, and astonishingly, and this is the last point I will make before I finish, the report makes sweeping conclusions about positive changes based on material that neither we nor the researchers can ascertain were ever taught. Um, these are altered books. They're not on the Palestinian Authority's um, Ministry of Education portal. They were not there when the report was written. They are not there now. There were no printed versions in circulation. And the George Eckhart Institute even acknowledges that these alterations were given to them by the EU after the report was finalized. So this is, you know, really quite astonishing. And, um, you know, answers really need to be given about this. So, so Ruth, I will end there. And uh, I hope I haven't gone on for too long. Um, uh, Marcus, it's such a pleasure to hear from you. You are very much on point, and of course, we have a thing longer at all. Um, I, we will now uh, ask uh, MEB Mandel to, to unmute yourself. Um, we want to ask your perspective on this subject, specifically also, if possible, if you can touch on this uh, EU report that was basically hidden or kept. Uh, there, have, there have been a lot of questions, and people want something in terms of accountability, and um, maybe as I said, you can give your perspective. Yeah, thank you. 
so uh, I guess I'm not able to add any expertise to what Markus Schäfer already has uh, uh, stated and conveyed uh, very well and informative. And I thank him for that. And uh, I'm closely listening. I just can share uh, the state of play, so to speak, in the parliamentary work in European Parliament towards the EU Commission and in some respects also the EU member states. Uh, actually, we have this uh, study, uh, the findings of Impact C, which have now also been confirmed by the EU Commission Georg Eckert Institute study. Uh, and in my view, and not only in my view, but in the view of a large number of colleagues from various political groups in European Parliament, the Commission must publish the report immediately uh, without uh, further ado. Uh, actually, it's paid by European taxpayers, and European taxpayers have the absolute right to receive proper and fully fledged information on the usage of their money here. It, actually, it's unacceptable that EU taxpayers' money is used to indoctrinate Palestinian children, as Markus Schiff has already pointed out, uh, that these textbooks uh, deny Israel's very existence, preach anti-Semitism, incitement, and the glorification of violence and terrorism. Uh, on a geopolitical level or on a foreign policy level or whatever you might call it, a negotiated two-state solution is also far, far away if things like that are still in place. So also those who let's say, want to take shortcuts sometimes to things that can never happen without a security guarantee for the people of Israel and other things, uh, must understand that this development is not supportive at all, not uh, regarding the children uh, of the Palestinians, not regarding uh, the usage of EU taxpayers' money, not regarding the fight against anti-Semitism, and not regarding any geopolitical goal uh, that might be existent. Uh, the Commission must act immediately and withhold some funding to the Palestinian Authority until it finally replaces these terrible textbooks, like Norway has done last year. So Norway, as you all may know, is not a EU member country, but uh, a European country that has already acted accordingly already last year. Uh, together with colleagues from the multipartisan transatlantic Friends of Israel group, I wrote open letters, several ones uh, over the uh, month and uh, more than a year to uh, Joseph Borrell, the high representative, the so-called foreign minister of the European Union, to neighborhood commissioner Oliver Vahili, who seems to be rather supportive uh, due to what I understand from talks with him and commission president Ursula von der Leyen, asking them to put part of the funding to the Palestinians in reserve until positive changes are made. These concerns, as Markus Schäf has already pointed out today, uh, are shared by a significant majority in the European Parliament uh, with regard to uh, uh, UNRWA fundings uh, in uh, the European Parliament's discharge report 2019 uh, on the EU general budget. It's reiterated that concerns about hate and violence being taught in Palestinian textbooks and that the salaries paid to teachers and public servants in the education sectors must be made conditional. Conditionality is the key word on educational material and uh, course content complying with UNESCO standards. Um, actually, uh, US Secretary of State Blinken also said last Tuesday that the Biden administration's funding of UNRWA is contingent on educational reform referring to educational materials that remove Israel from the map and praise terrorism and martyrdom. Uh, well, actually we face here a situation where we have to discuss think, things that are not discussable. Uh, it's uh, anti-Semitic ideology that is spread uh, among children in formal education procedures. This is uh, among the worst things that uh, can happen at all on this planet. And this is uh, in Israel. And uh, this is something that must never be funded by 
EU taxpayers' money or any other public money and should not be funded generally. And that's why we push things forward. I can also share with you uh, the development of last week and this week uh, that uh, there was a, let's say, uh, a probability that the European Commission will uh, will put the money for Palestinian textbooks on reserve uh, until things are solved. In the beginning of this week, it seems that further action will be needed until this will happen. Uh, well, we have to not only to be patient, but also to be very active and remain engaged and uh, remain pushing the European Commission. This is uh, clearly a parliamentary obligation we face here in European Parliament, but we are happy about each and everybody joining us from NGOs, from business, civil society, to science, academia, whatever, and whoever it might be in order to uh, convey the message to the European Commission that this actually draws a, a dark shadow on today's EU, that it's not clear what to decide, how to decide, and to decide quickly. Uh, that's why we will keep on running uh, in that field. Actually, we all, uh, can, I can imagine we all wish for a world where children are educated uh, in the first place by example, as all education is by example, usually are educated by example to respect each other and to support each other and to understand uh, mankind as one uh, entity uh, where each and everybody is dependent on each other, the pandemic is bad, but it provides us uh, with this lesson, actually, that this would be right and true and for the better of these generations and the future. But uh, the other way around is happening. Uh, children are indoctrinating against others. Uh, and this is uh, nothing we can let happen if we mean it when we talk about European values. And that's why we are active on a parliamentary level and very thankful again for the cooperation with the European Jewish Association and all the uh, the great experts all around the planet who uh, yeah, don't stop to figure out what's really going on in order to uh, provide a good basis for proper political decisions. Uh, dear M.P. Vandal, uh, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, the information you gave is very val uh, valuable, um, I would say, and important. Um, the fact that the European Commission uh, or that there are commissioners who take this issue very seriously, we are aware of that. And I think there's almost, I would say, um, I think it's an open secret that there is almost uh, an internal fight regarding the political di uh, direction. Um, I want to say you mentioned earlier that the majority of the European Parliament or that are, there are a lot of members of the European Parliament that um, take this issue seriously and they're working towards a solution. I want to just offer very briefly, very humbly, the example of my husband. He's just a simple taxpayer. He knows how, how, how hard I personally work towards this issue. And he basically is asking me why there are no results. You keep on saying that, oh, there is this uh, resolution, there is this report, there is condemnation from the UN uh, report, and why I don't see any changes? Why am I continuing as a taxpayer to keep on supporting something that I think is fundamentally wrong, as you said, uh, which has to do with uh, not only for the fact that it's demonization towards Jewish people, but the fact that we are putting uh, young people uh, in, in danger, basically. They're putting themselves into danger, and they are, they are, we are paying for, uh, for them to be um, indoctrinated into martyrdom and terror attacks and so forth. So is there a, a simple um, answer to that? Maybe I can ask both of you, is there a simple answer on, uh, we, there are a lot of uh, these types of um, briefings. So I have been to many conferences. I, I have seen very high level uh, politicians, both on the US that you very correctly mentioned, and here in the in the European continent, when do you think we might see something more concrete? Marcus, we can start with well, you. I, okay. I it just, I, you know, I think it's well above my pay grade to um, you know to try and uh, understand why, given the uh, enormous amount of information evidence that has been at everyone's fingertips now for so many years, um, you know, why it has still been uh, possible 
for this to be ignored in favor of, you know, what is essentially the status quo, what is in favor of, um, you know, the European, you, the Commission continuing with the same uh, methodologies, with the um, same thing it has done for so many years, as if this information doesn't exist. Um, it, it puzzles me too. And so I entirely understand uh, your husband. Um, you know, I can say, though, that um, we have seen examples, and, and uh, Lucas pointed this out, of places, um, and, and Norway is the example of this, where um, a responsible um, you know, set of politicians have looked at the evidence, have um, made an assessment that they don't want their taxpayers to be involved in inciting children to violence. They you know, did not get into um, the game of aid to the Palestinian Authority's Ministry of Education in order to incite children, but to, to give them a peace education, to give them a better life, to give them hope and something you know, to, to, to look forward to and to give them tools for a better life. And um, you know, they came to the conclusion that um, the only way that um, they can move that forward is by withdrawing their own funds in order that the uh, Palestinian Authority will understand that it has to make those changes. Now, and, and unfortunately, you know, there, were, there is not the, um, the understanding, as far as I can see on the side of the Palestinian Authority, of the gravity of the situation. The um, Palestinian Prime Minister um, made uh, a comment before a, um, before a cabinet meeting after the uh, Norwegian announcement was made. And he said, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but, but not by much, he said, um, we will take money from electricity and we will take money from water before we will take money to uh, away from printing these textbooks. And I think, you know, my reading of that is, how much the, this material is a national strategy for the Palestinian Authority, this vision of you know, this one state Palestine for the river to the sea, which will be gained through violence, through the sacrifice of, of young people, how much that is a national strategy. And, and you know, that is, um, that's unfortunately a very depressing conclusion, but, but my conclusion nonetheless. Having said that, um, I think, more and more of um, you know, those who share the view of the Norwegians that they do not want to be in the incitement game, they want to be in the game of improving lives of Palestinians, and um, draw the same conclusion as the Norwegians and withdraw funding for those textbooks, I think can only be a good thing and a positive thing. Thank you. Um, MEP Mantle. Yeah. I can only share my view on things that um, even because there is more complexity uh, in dealing with clear uh, positions when it comes to the Middle East and Israel, uh, we even have to put more effort on these questions. Um, we have uh, today the question of Palestinian textbooks and we have to keep on running on that. But uh, I share with you a different view. I'm more than happy to serve uh, for uh, my home country, Austria, in the European Parliament in the era of the Prime Minister Sebastian Kurz in my home country, because uh, we have a clear, holistic, so to speak, Austrian position when it comes uh, to no matter uh, whether it would be the government level or the parliamentary level uh, when it comes to the Middle East and Israel. But uh, in the public, or pub, uh, public opinion, so to speak, in media and otherwhere, in social media especially, uh, when Israel was heavily attacked by terrorists, and we know them all, and we follow them, and we try to prohibit their activities in Europe by law, by parliamentary and government decisions, and so on. When Israel was attacked, it was clear that uh, our Prime Minister Sebastian Kurz showed the public with the Israeli flag uh, on the uh, main uh, government building uh, in our capital, Vienna. And there uh, was critics, uh, not by a majority, but by a pretty loud minority. And uh, I just uh, uh, asked uh, around when I was uh, interviewed on that and so on, and I approached people 
with one simple question. If uh, France would be attacked by terrorists or uh, the United Kingdom would be attacked by terrorists, uh, maybe uh, these attacks would be uh, uh, f far more little than the ones against Israel and the Israel civilian population. Uh, nobody would doubt that it's a clear signal that in the capital of Austria, in Vienna, or in other European capitals and in other parts of the world, especially the free world, uh, the public would be presented with the flag of France or the UK then. Uh, but when it comes to Israel, there are discussions. And uh, I don't want to deal with that all my life. And I don't want uh, my children to uh, experience these differences in treating one state differently to each and every other state. Uh, and that's why, uh, uh, yeah, there is complexity, even if it's not with regard to content and not with regard to reason, <laughs> but uh, it's existing and we, we, we know the background, uh, the ideological background of these movements. And that's uh, why we all requested uh, to do our work in that field and to, uh, to, to try whatever we can to create a leverage for, for a better understanding and a better future. Thank you. Um, I think my husband I mentioned it, he lobbies me harder than um, other lobbyists. <laughs> so he just he just wants to see results, just like other, any other. I just mentioned it. Obviously, it's just uh, just like any other concerned citizen. Um, we just want to see that our money is not used towards violence. Obviously, uh, we're opening the floor for some questions. We have a member of parliament that wanted to uh, wanted to speak also, but I'm just going to see whether he's available. Um, my colleague Alex Benjamin, if you have a question, I think you have a question in the chat that you wanted to read, perhaps. Yeah, sure. So actually, one of the questions from uh, was already answered in terms of uh, it was a similar question to your to your um, to your husband's. Um, so that's been dealt with. A couple of other uh, inquiries. One, um, Marcus, specifically as to where people can find this uh, physical examples of. Uh, of uh, the kind of stuff that goes on in the Pal Palestinian textbooks. I suggested on the chat to check out your, your own resources that you have at Impact AC. So I presume that's, that's probably the best place to go. Um, and we have a question from Mikol Otolenghi. Um, he says, is defunding textbooks the only viable solution? Would that harm overall access to education for Palestinian students? And if I may, um, I'm going to staple on an addendum to that question. Um, and my question is as follows. Um, let's say that we do enact some changes in textbooks, which is great. And uh, Marcus was already alluding to the positive changes that have happened in places like Saudi when, there's, when there is engagement. But if the Palestinian Authority leadership is still carrying on with its sort of blood and thunder rhetoric, is it largely a pointless exercise? Um, so um, maybe we can come to MEP Mandel first on that. Uh, the, the specific question about does that, will, will a reduction or will freezing education harm the overall access to education for Palestinian students? MEP Mandel? I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly. The question is whether it, whether the, the general education, the opportunities of Palestinian students would be harmed. Uh, yeah, no, the, question, the, question, the question was, if, if we defund, let's say, for example, that we do defund and we say, OK, no more money to the Palestinian Authority for textbooks, what, uh, what impact that has on the ground? Um, and does it effectively deny uh, does it have any 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 negative negative effects? And and I was adding to that the question: Well, you know, uh, if the Palestinian Authority leadership is still spouting their hate speech and no filthy Jewish feet from a temple mouth, every pure every drop of blood spilt uh, is, is is martyrdom and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, um, you know, does it really make a huge difference on ground level? Uh, I guess yes, for at least two different reasons. Uh, the one is it's a leverage. Uh, I guess uh, also for I don't know uh, other other fields of education, they are in need uh, of this money. 
Uh, generally, EU is the largest contributor to development aid on this planet, and uh, in this field, uh, our money is needed for for at least the structures without any regard to content or ideology. And uh, if we stop to pay uh, due to this uh, ideological violent content, due to this anti-Semitic content, uh, it will be a leverage uh, for uh, the, uh, the management of the whole education system. That's the one side. Uh, and the other side is uh, it provides the world uh, uh, and maybe other institutions with a different view on things that we stop uh, to accept uh, violent ideologies in whatever uh, kind of cooperation with EU or with EU institutions. Uh, we have red lines and we don't only tell about red lines in beautiful speeches, but we uh, actually affect these red lines when it when it comes to violations of them uh, like that and uh, this this leverage on the one side and this example on the other side seem to me uh, as something that really can make a difference on the ground thank you uh, MUP Mandel I'm just going to come to uh, one more question which comes from Tina Adcock who is at the think tank Audia tour online um, Question is, what is the EU funding besides UNRWA? Uh, um, and we'll go, go to Marcus for this one, if this is okay. Uh, the, the, the question is, what kind of school books are the Israel Arab schools using? And are they, are they different of the schools in Judea and Samaria? I mean, that's a rather technical question, mm. but, uh, but um, is, there, is there a difference, Marcus? Yeah, so there, I mean, happy to answer that. So. The um, Israeli Arabs study the Israeli curriculum in Arabic. That is the, that is the best way of putting it. Um, you know, ultimately, um, it's, it's always about graduating uh, to go to, uh, you know, working for a particular graduation in every country. You know, in the UK, it's, it's A-levels, right, Tina? So, um, you know, the Israeli version of A-levels would be what's called the Bagot, um, the graduation. And so for um, Jewish students, um, they would be studying these, uh, the textbooks that they study um, in, in Hebrew. And most, not all, but most um, Arab uh, students in um, Israeli schools um, are studying um, the same textbooks um, in Arabic. There are you know, some differences, some changes here or there. Um, but, but, you know, to, to a great extent, it is exactly the same. So without drilling down too much, but you have the, um, the state system, the state religious system, and the Arabic um, school system, pretty much studying the same thing, because the state religious just have the extra hours for, for you know, religious studies, essentially. Um, then, of course, there is the um, ultra-religious uh, sector. They have a hodgepodge of different textbooks. Um, there's a question in Israel about whether the boys after the age of 13 are actually, you know, studying anything really except for religious studies, and the girls much more. And as I, as I mentioned, you know, those textbooks are, are not great. They do not incite because, you know, the, the, the ultra-religious are essentially pacifists, actually. Um, but, you know, they, they need modernizing, I would put it that way. Um, so, you know, I hope that that answers the question. Thanks. Uh, I think so. Um, and yeah, I mean, back to back to Lucas. Uh, sorry, back to MEP uh, Mandel. Sorry, <laughs> overly familiar there. I beg your pardon. Um, it's Lucas, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks for that. I can uh, just say that we have events with uh, Americans. Alex and I will say, Your Excellency will say, MEP is so important. The Americans are all first name basis. Where Alex and I were a little bit old fashioned. So. Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, Lucas, I'm going to stick with it, seeing as you've given me permission. Uh, uh, Lucas, so what sort of money are we talking about here when we're talking about EU funds? Um, specifically, okay, so we know about UNRWA. Um, and uh, but when it comes to education, I mean, it's very, very, very difficult because presumably there's a lot of different funding streams, and you need to be a bit of an expert to understand the. Well, you are an expert, but uh, I meant myself to 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 understand the 
the arcane opaque uh, uh, processes of, e of EU funding. Um, what, what sort of what sort of money are we talking about here? Um, you know, Ruth was alluding earlier on to taxpayers' money. Um, you know, ball, ballpark figures of, uh, of 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 what we're giving to the Palestinian Authority, which is supporting this stuff. And and uh, and, and and secondly, based on what you were saying about you know we have to do it, we have a red lines. It's, it's, it's very very important to have red lines. Um, what do you think? The, the the pushback will be from the from the Palestinian Authority side. Um, I, I think specifically the example of a martyrs fund where they were giving money to uh, to support terrorist uh, families, a sort of sliding scale of of reward depending on what the terrorists had done to Israeli citizens. You know, top 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 billing, top money going to people that have been assassinated. You get a lesser amount if you just blow somebody's hand off. I'm being facetious, but this is basically what we're talking about. So I'm wondering what kind of pushback one can expect uh, in terms of, you, you spoke earlier on about leverage. So yeah, basically what sort of, what sort of money are we talking about? And, and, uh, and um, you know, what kind of pushback can we expect? Uh, when we talk about EU money, we always talk about uh, membership fees from the 27 member states. Uh, that means uh, one point something percent of the GDP of a member state uh, is transferred to EU level as a membership fee. Uh, and uh, this is the only source since uh, we are discussing about uh, uh, so-called own sources on the union level, but we have not yet any in place. Uh, one source could be in the future uh, a digital tax uh, and another uh, that is discussed at least is a plastic tax, a so-called one, but that's a different issue. Today we talk about taxpayers' money with uh, in the member states of the European Union. Uh, so this is of concern for each and every taxpayer. That's also why uh, all of us, the parliamentarians, should also convey the information about the ongoing developments in their constituencies. Regarding pushbacks of the Palestinians, so um, uh, I can imagine that uh, they try to support the movements against Israel again, uh, like the BDS movement and others via uh, uh, maybe politicians and also parts of civil society and uh, other parts of societies within Europe uh, who are, let's say, uh, in collaboration with them or uh, open for these, uh, again, anti-Semitic uh, movements. And I would it put in the larger framework of disinformation. Uh, I'm also uh, active here in the European Parliament in the special committee against foreign interference into uh, the European democratic structures, including disinformation. Experts also call it as a part of hybrid warfare, that from the outside, uh, there are attempts to divide our societies, to split Europe, to trigger conflicts and so on. And this is clearly uh, not only done by state actors, but also by non-state actors. Uh, and among the non-state actors are terrorist organizations and these terrorist organizations seek uh, to spread this information within European societies and they use each and every channel for that because they can try whatever they want to try. If they fail, they try a different thing. It's easy for them uh, just to spread this information to divide our societies. And this is something that's uh, ongoing and this is maybe one of the possible pushbacks uh, uh, if we decide properly, but uh, we should not be hesitant to decide properly as always in politics. Uh, no, uh, there is no alternative to decide properly with regard to values and, and security and everything else we've already discussed about. And, and, and Alex, if I could just um, yeah. weigh in and there will be people on this call with far more expertise than, than myself, but my understanding is in relation to the uh, funding of the EU to the Palestinian Authority, it goes through the Pegasse Fund, which is a, again, do not hold me to the figure, but my understanding is somewhere around 350 million um, euro or thereabouts annually. 
And, and, and there was a previous question about, um, you know, freezing funds. Again, my understanding is a suggestion of a 5% reserve. So, you know, that's 5% of that figure, um, which is by no means, you know, going to be the, you know, be all and end all of the EU's funding to Palestinian Authority, but it goes to exactly to what Luke has said, which is, um, you know, the leverage and the importance of, you know, standing up and saying uh, for this, you know, we will not put up with this anymore. Um, you know, none of those figures that I have put out there, um, I, I would want to be quoted on, but I think they are kind of ballpark. Okay, thank you. Okay. Can I just say that I apologize because we're supposed to have a, a member of parliament for a national, uh, from a national parliament, basically, uh, because we heard the work of the EU. And I wanted to say that maybe one of the other things that we can do is also put pressure from the national level. Every, every small win, if you like, on national level contributes towards the, the overall EU policy. Unfortunately, we have technical problems and uh, our member of parliament is still trying to, to connect. Um, but uh, maybe specifically on that, MEP Mandel, I wanted to say, is that something that is easier or harder to work on on a national or the EU level? In my case, it's easier. In my case, it's easier on national level, uh, but I guess that's different from from country to country. But uh, yeah, I, I don't want to be, let's say, too too easy about it. Uh, it's really true, uh, and I mean it when I mention it's great to to follow my political priorities in the era of Sebastian Kurz because it's clear there's no doubt uh, where Austria stands and uh, what the future perspectives are with regard to the Middle East and Israel. Uh, and it's good to follow that path on a parliamentary level. It would be much more difficult for a parliamentarian. I, I would do it anyway, but it would be much more difficult if I had to discuss each and everything with my own prime minister, but it's quite the other way around. And uh, I'm happy that uh, we are like-minded and uh, government and parliament on European level clear here. Uh, we all know that uh, there are different histories on relations with Israel, different positions, different, uh, I would say, prejudices as well in different uh, European states and also EU member states. And that's why it really depends on where you come from, whether, uh, yeah, where it's, where, it's, where, where it's easier or less easy. Uh, but uh, something is positive on European level. Uh, we have a strong, really multi-partisan, strongly connected, really like-minded, and let's say uh, with a lot of mutual confidence uh, established uh, Transatlantic Friends of Israel Network and generally uh, Friends of Israel Network. Uh, and, it's, and this is a positive aspect to work because you always know uh, you're in a good framework of, of, of like-minded people of goodwill, and when I call it friendship, it's, it's also mutual. <laughs> Israel is showing a lot of friendship for Europe and for EU, not only with regard to security, but with regard to, to academia and exchange in many different fields. And that's why we have, to, we have to follow that path. I had even today the opportunity to convey the message in an interview with the public broadcaster of Austria that we uh, urgently need a new uh, convening of the uh, EU-Israel Association Council and a new EU-Israel uh, EU Association Agreement uh, because it's the old one is outdated and uh, there are so many opportunities uh, of mutual interest uh, that, uh, that can be uh, achieved and that's what we, what we have to work on. I'm afraid that we'll have to join to a different uh, panel in four minutes, actually, at 5 p.m. in Brussels time. Uh, that's why I'm running out of time a little bit, and I'm more than happy to meet all of you. Thank you so much. We aim to finish at uh, five. Uh, just my last question was to Marcus. I was going to compare the US and, um, and the Europe. I'm personally quite um, impressed with uh, the amount of work that has been done here in Europe. Um, when I started my work in uh, Europe, I wanted to say that um, I had no idea that we actually had uh, European friends, if you like. I had no idea that MEP Mandel existed. I was obviously because of the media I was far more aware of the work that in the US. So I wanted to ask you the cheeky question. 
who is doing better at the moment. I do see a lot of very strong um, political will on both uh, sides of the Atlantic. But maybe you can just give us an overall picture, if you like, of, uh, of the continental differences. Indeed. So, so you know, f firstly, I would say in relation to, um, to the incitements in Palestinian textbooks and, you know, work done to, 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 to stop that happening, um, I, I think the European members of parliament, uh, Lucas, in the in the lead, um, joined by uh, joined by his colleagues, are absolutely exemplary. And um, honestly, there is no real um, no real example of that uh, of the amount of uh, progress and work um, that that has been done um, elsewhere. I would say that um, in the United States, um, in a, in a parliamentary sense, that is in Congress. Uh, there is really important work being done by Mr. Brad Sherman of uh, California, who brought into Congress what was HR 23, uh, sorry, 4323, the Palestinian Peace and Tolerance in, in Education Act, which is now with the new Congress, they reintroduced it is now HR uh, 2374. Um, it is a really important piece of legislation. It is uh, what the Americans call bipartisan. Uh, supported um, on both sides of the aisle. And again, Mr. Uh, Mr. Sherman is leading the charge on that in this Congress, as he did in the last Congress. Um, I, I would also say that institutionally, and I think, um, I think this is um, actually where, um, you know, one can really take one's, one's hat off to, to, to the Americans, you know, looking at the State Department, the National Security Council, um, the White House, both in the last administration and in this administration as well, um, there is a real understanding about um, that necessity for change. There are, you know, they are constantly asking for and receiving briefings from us uh, on the state of textbooks in the region and particularly about Palestinian textbooks and um, a high level of professionalism, which has led, as, as Lucas said, to, to, to Mr. Blinken saying very clearly last week, the anti-Semitism in those UNRWA textbooks need, as in the Palestinian textbooks taught by UNRWA, let's be clear about that, needs to be removed. He will not stand for it. His State Department will not stand for it. And I think that was extraordinarily important. Thank you so much. Um, we actually had problems, as I said earlier. Uh, MEP Mandel, thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, Lucas, please do, uh, sorry, Marcos, please do stay. Uh, we had a, a problems, technical problems earlier, having the member of parliament. Now he finally was able to log in. So if it's okay with you, I will ask my guest to just uh, stay for a minute longer. Uh, MEP Karagounis from the parliament of Greece, uh, we welcome you if you can unmute yourself. The question I want to put to you is, we heard already from the European Parliament and briefly just now also from uh, Marcos, Mr. Marcos Seth on the, on the difference between uh, the US and uh, the European um, uh, efforts that are made uh, at the moment regarding this issue, regarding putting condi conditionality, if you like, on the money that the EU gives. Um, I wanted to ask you as a member of parliament from a national parliament, uh, how do you see things from your perspective and what actions can, uh, from a national perspective, be taken regarding this? The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ruth. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, I did technical problem. I couldn't uh, follow all the discussion, but I'm sure that this discussion is uh, very fruitful. And of course, congratulations one again to you, to EGA, to Rabbi Margolin for this very interesting uh, initiative and a very sensible topic. Uh, so let me just uh, uh, share with you my, my views. Uh, of course, uh, education is a very easy right and uh, the EU is a very strong supporter of the right uh, to education. And as it is well known, uh, EU by far is the largest donor to the Palestinian Ministry of uh, Education. It has funded uh, many programs in order to build schools and uh, facilitate students in attending. Uh, EU remains the biggest donor of external uh, assistance to the Palestinians. Uh, nevertheless, uh, an issue has been raised with regard to the funding provided for educational purposes. For years, Israel has said that European funds uh, have been used for textbooks that incite hate and violence. It has argued that European funds have been used by Palestinian NGOs affiliated with terrorist organizations. 
as of course you already mentioned, I'm sure that you have already, already mentioned it. Uh, it is the first time in years that the EU has made the commitment to prevent its donation and coming to your thought, uh, 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 Ruth, uh, from being used by the wrong people uh, for the wrong reason. Uh, it has called for a proactive recovery of uh, misused funds and uh, thorough check of organization receiving such funds. So this is a very, very good development. Uh, moreover, uh, the European Commission is uh, held accountable for its funding, making the importance of monitoring these funds even greater. Uh, according uh, to NGO Monitor and the Jerusalem Post, uh, over the past uh, 10 years, the EU has allocated some 30, 80 million euros to projects involving terror-linked NGOs. Only now, uh, UNRWA has been commissioned by the EU to remove incitement from Palestinian school textbooks. A request Israel has been making for decades, and that's uh, true. Uh, only now, salary paid to teachers and public service in the education sector will be made conditional on education uh, material that hold the UNESCO standards for peace and tolerance, etc. Only now has the EU acknowledged that thousands of children have been receiving education inciting anti-Semitism, extremism, and violence. This is a big change given the long standing pro-Palestinian stance of the EU. No doubt, education plays an important role in forming people's opinions, maybe not the biggest role, as opinions uh, are also formed by what we are told within our household, especially uh, at a younger age. They're formed by media and, of course, by personal experiences. No doubt, Palestinian education is based on hatred, and Israel and the Jews are portrayed as the enemy and the vicious other. Obviously, pure hatred based on stereotypes is not the way to go. Uh, way, wanting to wipe out the other from the map is not a realistic option. It is imperative that the education system is uh, rev uh, revisited and uh, that the points of conflict are dealt with in a less passionate manner. It is difficult to see the situation with the other side's eyes, but education can uh, help identify, identify common ground Education can help strengthen the lines of communication. Education can help raise the standard of living. Instead of saying, burn the other, let uh, us say how we can find a solution with the other. And this is my message, uh, if uh, I can say. Uh, even in my country, Greece, we have gone uh, through something like this. The experience of being under Ottoman rule for 400 years and the events in the 1920s have left a deep scar. Uh, yet in the past, the education system has uh, tried to explain certain situations in order to help uh, subside this negative feeling. Changing school uh, books is a difficult task and creates uh, very uh, staunch reactions. It has to be done in a very delicate but steady manner. And this is my message, what uh, the EU have to, have to do and what he is, uh, is it obliged to do. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you so much. I know that our I know that our speaker also has to leave, Mr. Marcos. Unless you wanted to say something else, Marcos, feel free to um, to maybe give uh, some uh, information on where our audience can reach you. Well, our, our, our website is, uh, is is freely available. All of our research goes on the website, uh, so we are utterly you know transparent in that sense. Um, I wish the frankly the European Commission was as transparent. Uh, with their research, I, I would like to say um, how fascinated I was here. I, I was to hear about um, the, the honourable member from Greece's uh, comments in relation, both his his remarks, which were absolutely uh, to point, and also in relation to um, changes in Greece in in their curriculum in relation to um, Ottoman rule. Um, you know, this is um, you know a, a regional phenomenon. And, you know, as I, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, um, Jordan, the, the UAE, you know, Tunisia um, in our region, in, in MENA, in, in, in the Middle East and, and North Africa, and, and clearly uh, Greece as well. Um, and I would, you know, like to think across the Balkans, uh, you know, curricula are being improved because peace education is absolutely um, intrinsic to the kind of tolerant societies we want to see in the future. Textbooks are absolutely integral to the way young people see the world. 
Um, and, and in our region, you know, often there is not that much printed material. And so the authority of textbooks is, um, is so great that, that, you know, obviously clearly less the case in Greece and in Israel, but in so many other countries uh, in the region. Um, and rulers know this. And, and as I pointed out, and um, the, 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 the Honourable Member from Greece wasn't um, here when I was talking about the Turkish curriculum, but he, he'd be interested to know that Mr Erdogan has made that curriculum worse. He has um, put into that curriculum a you know, pan-Ottoman uh, view of the world, which young uh, Turkish uh, children are, are, are now receiving. And this is a retrograde step. This is a, a step backwards. Those UNESCO defined standards of peace and tolerance are essential to those societies we want to see, respect for the other, historical accuracy, peacemaking as a way to resolve conflict. Absolutely. It is, it is as true for the Palestinians as it is for my children in Israel, for children across the region and across the world. And that, that is really what we're trying to achieve. Thank you. Dear Marcus, just to say earlier, our MEP from Austria, he, he, he said about Austria, about his uh, chancellor, his, his, um, his prime minister. I just want to also boast about our own prime minister from Greece, that he's doing an excellent job. And obviously, MEP Karagounis, uh, he's an EJ uh, um, member of our advisory board, and uh, he's really has been working very hard towards this issue. And I'll be happy, obviously, to give the details to you and to our other colleagues online. I'm going to give the floor now back to my colleague Alex Benson to just say goodbye and we want to thank you once again for being with us and for this really amazing and very informative uh, briefing. Alex. Yeah, thanks very much everyone. Um, there's really nothing further to add. Uh, um, Marcus's last missive was what I call a mic drop moment. Uh, there's no way anyone could put anything better than, uh, than he just put it. The future's at stake. Our youth is at stake. My daughter uh, kids in Israel, kids in the West Bank, whatever, they're all entitled to a, a decent education free from hate, uh, which is extremely important. We thank uh, everyone for their time today. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll revisit this issue. This is an issue which, uh, which, which uh, uh, keeps on going and, um, and uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll catch you further on down the road. So thank you everyone for your attendance. We stand by ready to answer any questions. Check out Impact SE, which is, Amazing work, um, uh, Marcus Kolakavod. And uh, that's it. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll see you at our next briefing. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.